Welcome back to Addiction and Codependency Recovery. I am your host, Heidi Rain. I am so glad that you're here today for this extremely important discussion on one of the most toxic and dysfunctional co-addicted relationships that one can have. Now, our goal here at this channel and with this podcast is to equip and empower you by helping you become aware of toxic, codependent, hidden patterns that we engage in in relationships that keep us stuck, struggling, and suffering. And my goal is to help you break free from those patterns once and for all so that you can have the healthy, happy relationships that you truly deserve. So we're going to talk about one of these most co-addicted relationships today, and then I'm going to give you the exact steps that you need to start the process of breaking free. Many of you who listen to this podcast or watch these videos are in relationships with addicts and alcoholics. That's not exclusively who watches this. There are many people who are in other types of toxic and dysfunctional relationships uh, with narcissists and things like that, because addiction does look a lot like narcissism. No matter what kind of flavor your dysfunctional relationship is, know that the tools and insight and resources you gain here will help you in every relationship in your life that's toxic or dysfunctional, no matter if they have addiction in them or not. But today we are going to focus on a co-addicted relationship. Now notice, I don't mean two addicts and two alcoholics in a relationship. I mean, co-addicted. One of us could be an addict and alcoholic and the other is not. Now you might be thinking, how in the hell I am not addicted to this person or this situation. But then let me ask you this. How many times have you said to yourself, something has got to change, something's got to give, I can't be in this anymore, I can't keep going back into this and getting sucked back in, but you keep getting sucked back in. Now, I'm going to talk about how and why that happens today and how to break you free. But the first step is to actually be willing to consider that you might be playing a role in this toxic and dysfunctional relationship. You might be enacting some patterns that are certainly contributing to the toxicity in this relationship. Now, I happen to think that's super empowering because anytime that we can take personal responsibility, we regain our personal power because your power lies in your ability to accept responsibility for the things in your life that you can change. Of course, there are many things we can't change. And knowing the difference between those things is the wisdom that we hope to impart on you through this work that we get to do. So let's dive in. I want you to imagine first two people that uh, grow up separate, independent of each other in two different households. However, they have a very similar upbringing. Let's call one of the girls uh, Anita. Anita grows up in a very dysfunctional family. Her, her dad's an alcoholic. Her mom is violent. Uh, she, she constantly is being criticized, hyper-criticized for everything that she does. She suffers emotional, physical, psychological abuse. Dad's an alcoholic. He's out to lunch most of the time. So she doesn't have any kind of real support. She certainly doesn't have any example of a good, healthy functioning relationship. And she, she's struggling in this household. There are siblings in this household and, 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 and she grows up feeling like, oh my God, I, I just want to be able to escape this situation. And then you have Rick over here and Rick grows up in a very similar environment. He has an addicted father and he has an absent dad. He's out to lunch and his mother is also hypercritical. He can never do anything right. She's also mentally and physically and verbally abusive to him. So both of them have extremely similar backgrounds. Here's what happens though. Anita grows up and she discovers that she has personal power to overcome her situation through her personal responsibility. So she becomes early on in that household, nine going on 40. She starts taking care of the other siblings in that household. She starts pouring all of her resources into them and making sure that they're okay. She also excels in school and realizes that that's an outlet for her. So she studies all she can and tries to make really good grades. And she starts to realize, well, I can get accolades and I can get love and acceptance and approval through achievement and through accomplishments. So she starts doing this type of thing. She starts joining different teams and being captain of this and director of that and et cetera, et cetera. And when she grows up, 
she turns into this really stellar person that believes in personal responsibility. She always believes you step up. She gets super into personal development. She believes that there is a way when there's a will, there's a way and you can make anything happen in your life. And anybody can become super great and super des destined for, for greatness, no matter what kind of upbringing they have in their original family dynamic. Now, Rick starts school and he's kind of like the lost kid. He's looking around and he's thinking, man, I wish somebody at school would pay attention to me. It's just like home here. I have all these siblings and everybody else gets all the attention and my sister gets all the accolades and everything else. But here I am just kind of stuck and nobody's paying attention to me. And I just wish a teacher would notice me, but he hides. He hides because he feels like kind of like, why bother? What's the point? And so maybe he starts getting in trouble because he feels like, you know what? If I'm in trouble, maybe then I can get some kind of attention. And he notices, yeah, that actually seems to work when he starts acting out or being late to school or truant or whatever, that sometimes people start to notice, at least school is noticing, even if at home, he's not getting the kind of results that he wants. And he notices that when he fights with his siblings or he creates a discord in the house, then his parents pay attention to him. When he starts to get um, rough with everybody and, and engages in, you know, fighting with his siblings, then his parents are all over him. They don't pay attention to him otherwise, but when he's creating havoc, they come along. And he realizes, you know what, even then it's not enough. Why bother? What's the point? So he starts getting into drugs and alcohol and thinking, well, I can really, you know, I need some kind of relief. I, there's nobody to bond to. There's nobody that cares about me. Maybe alcohol will care about me. And when he drinks, he starts to feel really connected to himself. Maybe he starts to feel like it's not so bad. It certainly starts medicating the pain that he has at home. Anita medicates the pain through achievement. She's out there winning awards. She's out there climbing ladders. She's out there doing the damn thing. And Rick is over here medicating through drugs and alcohol and numbing out and thinking, why bother? Now, one fine day, Anita and Rick meet each other and they hook up. And Anita looks at Rick and goes, there's something familiar about you. I mean, maybe it's her dad. I don't know, but there's something familiar about your dysfunction. And I can see past that dysfunction. I think underneath everything, you're just really understood, Rick, misunderstood, Rick. I think that you have an exceptional heart. I think you are a good person. I've heard your story and upbringing. And I know I was kind of invented that same environment, but I believe in you, Rick. I know that the right person just needs to come along and pour into you. And you're, I'm going to, you're going to, I'm going to save your life. I'm going to help you, Rick, get better. And Rick goes, oh my God, thank God somebody finally notices me and is going to rescue me and save me. And this dynamic is fixer and victim. Now you can find these personalities in my latest book, Attachment Personality Patterns, Understanding Your Unique Codependency Programming. You can download that book for free over at HeidiRain.com and learn more about the fixer personality pattern and the victim personality pattern. Outside of this, there are five criteria for each that kind of qualifies each of these patterns. But let's get back to these two. So they start dating and hooking up and Anita's thinking, yeah, he definitely is drinking too much and he likes to party a little bit, but I bring out the best people. I knew how to save my family. I knew how to function in that shit show. Surely I can help out Rick. And Rick is thinking really excited. Finally, somebody sees me and is going to help me and help me bring out the best in me. So they hook up and it is a match made in hell. They think heaven, but hell. And why this is so addictive, because we are getting our needs met, right? Anita is getting her need met because she, Anita feels love through feeling needed. She loves to feel needed. Anita needs to be needed. Okay, that's how we're going to remember that. And she feels valuable when she's pouring into Rick. She feels important and special and wanted and needed when Rick says things to her, like, if it weren't for you, I would be dead. If you weren't here, nobody else cares about me like you care about me. And she really feels good. That's how she knows she's loved. And Rick feels really loved because he's been waiting in the story he tells himself his whole life is the right person will try to save you and rescue you versus actually giving you uh, your own personal responsibility to put, take your life in your own hands. They'll fix it for you. Now, deep down, the issue is that Rick doesn't really believe that he can be saved. He wants to, but this pattern of a victim is so ingrained that he will start to resent Anita start to be upset with her that she is now all of a sudden, Anita is starting to say, well, 
I thought the love was enough. I thought just me being in a relationship with you would be enough for you to want to change, but I see you're not doing the work. So Anita starts to get pretty pissed off. She starts to get resentful of Rick thinking, I'm giving you all this great ideas, all this super advice. And what are you doing with it? Fucking nothing. You're not taking the advice I'm giving you. You're not doing the things I'm telling you to do. And every time I tell you to do something, you have an excuse for why you didn't do it. Oh, well, AA doesn't work for me. It works for everybody else. And I tried to make that appointment with a therapist, but she didn't know what she was doing and she didn't call me back. And, and, you know, I tried to go to that meeting, but the meeting wasn't there and they didn't tell me where the new meeting was. And, you know, I know, but alcohol really isn't my problem. It's this other thing. So I'm just going to try it my way first. And you don't believe in me enough to try things my way. And they, they start to like be at odds with each other. And Anita gets really resentful that Rick is just, isn't listening to her. And then Rick starts to feel that old familiar feeling of you're just like my mother you criticize me and don't believe in me. And you think I'm a piece of crap, just like my mom did. And now we're back in this childhood trauma bonded bullshit. Like, oh my God. And, and Anita's going, well, you're just like my dad who I wanted to quit drinking and did everything I could to try to fix that and try to help him, but he never got better. And here Rick is like, well, you're just like my mom who never, who always criticized me and I could never be enough. And now we're at an impasse. And usually this is where I get people in these types of dynamic that come to me in my programs where they say, I, I know that deep down this relationship can work. I'm not quite sure. I don't know if it can be saved or not. So can you help me? Can you help me figure out how to be with Rick and not enable Rick, but support his recovery? And, and can you help me see Rick, help, help Rick get it? Can you help the lights go on right with him? And so I'd say, absolutely, we can do that work. But the very first thing is, is for you who's watching this or listening to this to take personal responsibility and recognize the role that you're playing in this dynamic. Fixers and victims are the same side of the same or different sides of the exact same codependency coin. It's just, we manifested our codependent behaviors differently. Each of these people, Anita and Rick, both looked, were born into their family dynamic looked around, surveyed the land and went, who the hell do I need to be in order to be okay in this family dynamic? And Rick was like, just bury your head or get in trouble or wait to be rescued. And Anita was like, it's all up to me. I got to do it myself, my way. I've got to fix everybody and everything. And it's all on me. So they both have this dysfunctional idea. So for you, the first step is to understand what pattern are you enacting in this relationship and make a conscious decision to go into that pattern long enough so you can recognize exactly how you're participating in it and then start to unravel and untouch and untether from that program that's been installed in you and install a new program that's going to work better in your relationships and in your life. And so after we take that awareness, we start to look around. When I work with somebody, it's like, what do you really want? Well, I want this to be fixed. I want this, but, but ultimately what is the vision? What type of relationship do you really want? Well, I want to be supported, Heidi. I want to have a partner. I want somebody who's going to come alongside and pour into me the way that I pour into them and really be there for me. And it's an equal partnership and okay, great. Well, you're not going to find that in a fixer and a victim because a hero always needs somebody to save and rescue. And that's not a partner. Partner doesn't need rescued and saved. Right. So we have to be willing to look at your attachment to helping people in order to feel loved, your attachment to wanting to be of value and service in order to secure your spot in a relationship. That's what we have to work through, along with, of course, in my program, Codependency and Addiction Recovery, I tell you exactly how to help somebody take personal responsibility for their own recovery. That's that's a must. That's a no brainer. All right, helping somebody to you release the responsibility of, of you figuring out everything yourself. Where's the dreaming center? How's, how am I going to help them? Uh, where are the meetings? Let me drive them there. Let me make sure they're sending me pictures from inside that I know they're there. Let me check all the pills and open the bottle and see how many are in there. Let me dole them out and make sure, you know, trying to control everything and fix everything. And you have to take a step back and say, how do I give that all over? and deal with the fear and anxiety and massive panic attacks that are going to come with giving that responsibility over. I understand that that is absolutely maddening because most people don't get this part. Most people don't understand that fixers believe that if you stop fixing, your loved one is going to die. 
I, I know that because I've been running this family program and working in this codependency as an expert for over a decade. And I've helped thousands of people and hundreds of families heal. So I don't underestimate the amount of fear that it, that is present and how we need to be conscious of that and cognizant of that. So we can walk through and appease that and restore peace to you while you're on this journey. I completely get that. What I'm telling you isn't easy. It's simple and the concepts of how to relinquish responsibility and how to detach. I have all the step-by-step processes, but it's not easy to do, is it? Especially when you think that somebody could die as a result of you letting go. But I promise you, if you walk this walk with me and you go through this course and you learn all the information, you have a better shot of helping somebody save their own life uh, than ever than you have ever before, because you'll have all the tools that you need necessary in order to know exactly what to do to get somebody the help they need. And there's a very fine line between helping and hurting when it comes to addiction. So this is one of the most addict co-addicted relationships. That's why when you get out or you try to detach your fear and guilt gets the absolute best of you, the addict or alcoholic as the victim will shame and manipulate and gaslight you and say things like, well, if you love me, you stay with me and accept me as I am. You don't love me at my worst. You need to love me at my worst. Uh, I thought you were the only person that cared about me and here you now are abandoning me. I mean, the shame and guilt is real. It's real. And so you need to learn how not to get sucked into that shame and manipulation and guilt and gaslighting so that you can maintain a strong position rooted in the truth of what really works to help somebody get well, what really is going to help you to live that life that's fulfilling and, and, and and peaceful. Amen. Right. And so that's what I want to help you do. Hopefully you've gotten some insight today as to potentially how you participate in this pattern. I'd say for now, definitely go over to Heidi Rain and download the book, uh, Attachment Personality Patterns. And then the next thing is I just created a brand new mini course over on my site called Boundaries with an Addict or Alcoholic. Let's be real boundaries is the, is the bare minimum, right? Understanding how to say to somebody and articulate what you're thinking and what you're feeling and what you're willing to tolerate and not tolerate in your relationship anymore is level one. Okay. So I would start there. It's, it's right over there. It's on demand access. It's a self-paced four part master master series. You can have immediate access to it. And I would highly recommend that you start there. And then of course, if you want to go deeper with me and you want to join our codependency and addiction course uh, program coaching that includes me live with you every single step of the way, every single week for a period of 12 weeks, then I'd say go over to HeidiRain.com and schedule a complimentary consultation so you can learn more about it. My goal, again, is to help you break free of this pattern. The fixer isn't who you are. It's who you've needed to be. The same is true with the addict or alcoholic. The victim isn't who they are. It's who they've needed to be in order to survive that dynamic. And anybody can break free from a pattern. Pattern is not pathology. It's not a sickness that needs to be cured. It's a patterning that needs to be undone. All right. I look forward to helping you. I look forward to serving you. I look forward to pouring into you and coming alongside of you on this journey to health and healing. Take excellent care of yourself. And until the next time, I'll see you really soon. Bye-bye.